magic time when you're like, I wouldn't say you're on fire, but I mean, it feels like everything you do, you like, ah, oh, it works. You can you can keep moving, keep moving, and you're just mm. making things. And sometimes I struggle on the rough for like two hours. I look at it. I just try to do some, add some sparkles and some nice shadings and everything. But I'm when I'm trying to be super honest with what I did is like, not good. It's terrible. By the way, <laughs> the thing is, because you're re you're working remotely, no one can see that stuff that you put in put away you put in trash hey everybody welcome back so today uh, I've tried to post a new video where I get the chance to talk to Batis Luca. Whenever I've traveled the world, meeting different networks and, and you know popping into different studios, especially in North America, all I keep hearing is one name in terms of remote work and a trustworthy person to collaborate with if you're working from home or you know remotely, and that is Batis Luca, based in Paris, an incredible designer, artist, manager and all around nice guy. So please check out this interview and tell me what you think. All right, have a great day, bye. Hey, Baptiste. Hey, hi, Yves. how's it going? Good, man. Crazy Corona times. Tell me about it. <laughs> um, so thanks for making the time because I know that uh, ironically, for someone like yourself, it's probably a busy time. Well, absolutely. It's been a pleasure doing it. Um, it's quite busy at the moment, yeah. So no, not too much meditation at the moment. Mostly work yeah. and cooking. That's it. <laughs> Working, cooking. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so you're uh, born and bred in France. Yes. Based in Paris. You studied at Emicol, is that right? Emicol in Lyon, yes. From my understanding, uh, the majority of your clients are North American. Is that correct? Yes, they are. Yeah, I'm starting, I was working basically for French studios for over for like a decade. Mm -hmm. And then I had the opportunity, um, thanks to a friend, Eric Wies, mm -hmm. that, um, who introduced me to a few people in LA and I did like a few work mm -hmm. and my work fitted well. So they kind of offered me a few freelance job and start, it started like this. It yeah. was supposed to be mostly like a first um, one-time job. And then I met new people, people moved from one company to another. And yeah, my network kind of inc I mean, increased. I got yeah. to meet more people. So, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm going to take some credit for that. Because do you remember, do you remember Annecy when uh, you were walking past and I was like, hey, come and meet here. You know here. what? It's absolutely true. And I know exactly <laughs> I where it was. That. I know. I remember the restaurant. It's called the Arpege in Annecy. Yes, yes. Because I'm from, I'm from Annecy. So I remember you sitting and introduced me to Eric. So, yep, you can take full credit on that as well. Well, I can take it like that, this much credit. But no, uh, I don't know. What do you think? That's, uh, yeah, Eric's good. good guy. I'm glad... Uh, uh, I'm so glad that it worked out. And, and, you know, obviously we've known each other for a while. And, and the one thing that's always stood out for me is, is that your work ethic is just second to none. I mean, you're just incredibly uh, dedicated. So it doesn't surprise me that, you know, it exploded from that introduction. So you um, have now had like a number of years of real experience working remotely. Yes. So I think that puts you in an uh, interesting place to give people, you know, just some tactical advice about how you manage that, right? Well, um, I think, we're, I mean, when I started working um, in French studios, I, I worked uh, for different projects, but I was lucky to find some like freelance job that I was doing at night. So I was really, I really wanted to get better in my drawing and I felt like, having like a freelance gig for um, a commercial small art direction for a project that was lasting like two months or so mm. um, really helped me um, being able to, to do more. Um, that makes total sense. And then 
I, and weirdly, I was finding that I was more predictive and better in my skills mm -hmm. by being, uh, I wouldn't say pressured, but I mean like uh, having too much work. Like I didn't have time to struggle. I, I, I need to do it straight away. So I, 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 I became faster in my, in my drawings and my paintings and everything. So that was, this was really um, something that kind of helped me. And then the freelance part became like too big. Mm -hmm. So thanks to, yeah, that's first big job that I got in freelancing. I stopped working for um, like office hours studios and right. I became full-time freelancing. Um, what I can tell you is that, um, I, w I mean, I'm lucky enough to have my wife, Marianne, uh, who's an illustrator. So she has like, I mean, she works at a certain hour a day mm -hmm. and she, we just managed to get like a frame for our work, which is like really stable. So what I'm hearing is that you, you heard, you got some, um, some genuine sort of like, you know, hard skills, I guess, like technical skills from the freelance stuff. And like you say, getting more efficient because you, you had so much on, you couldn't get over, overly precious. Which exactly. I think a lot of people forget. Um, and then the support, right? Having support of your base, of your family. Um, so that seems to be like a really like positive kind of like circle that you got yourself into, which is amazing. Um, but what were some of the challenges that you faced then? Like in terms of like, uh, maybe soft skills or technologically, uh, like uh, the things you had to sort of purchase, install, like yeah, what were your challenges? Well, I think the, um, I mean, six or seven years ago, the technology wasn't that it, as, as efficient as it is now mm -hmm. because of the video quality. Uh, there weren't as much people doing it as now. Um, I feel like, um, I mean, a lot of things is with trusting people. I think meeting the people once is the first step mm. and making sure like people can rely on you. You just like, when you say a date or, or um, a due date, you're not going to change it. And if you mm. have to change it, making sure that you tell this, the, the people you're working with ahead of time so they don't discover like five hours before that you're not going to be delivering things. Um, I think working with institutes before, helps you understanding um, who does what and how important it is to give your work back on time. So that's that, that empathy for, uh, you know, having some real student experience has given you the empathy to be able to sort of imagine someone else's struggle, even remotely. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I was uh, art directing and head of backgrounds. And so I was dealing, I did like a lot of management with people and even though I was working in French studios, working with people remotely. So mm -hmm. there was many of things, I mean, many things from with people I work with that was working really well. So I took them as, a, as an example. And right. some people I knew I couldn't really rely on them that much. Mm -hmm. And I always felt like I was having some difficulties. So I was trying to put myself in, yeah, in people's mind and what would you like to do? No one talks about like, you know, having empathy for the the other person on the receiving end of whatever you're doing, um, which gives you that motive for the discipline, right? Yeah, exactly. And also, like, even I was working remotely, um, pretty, I mean, even though I'm working with people in US studios or Canada or UK, um, I felt that um, I was dealing with other artists, so I had to manage other artists I see. who were also working remotely. Well, that, and that, well, that's also an interesting, so it's a culture of working remotely, everybody understands it, but you mentioned there the word management, like how, like you, I think there's a lot there to unpack, but like your journey from maker, like obviously you're, you're a very competent artist, but um, uh, you know, I saw your first steps into management when we worked together way back in the day, but obviously you've become a very competent management manager and a, a remote manager. I mean, that must be quite challenging. No? It is, it, yeah, um, well, the first, tip I could tell people would be to make sure you separate your day really clearly. For mm. instance, I always felt like drawing in the morning until like one or two uh, are my best hours. Okay. So I'm trying to, to not having too many meetings, too many, uh, I really focus on the drawings, on the paintings, um, 
on all of the things that require a lot of concentrations and everything. So I just tell people, please try to not to do too much meetings mm. uh, at that time. For some reason, after lunch, um, it's basically what I'm, tr I'm trying to um, meet the people I'm working with and answer email as much as I can, um, getting some feedbacks. I mean, it's especially on the last prediction I worked on. So I wanted to do like a Skype meeting uh, or a blue jeans meeting to bring some energy to the team and yeah. see if there were things that were, they were missing from them. If I feel like some artists were, there was a lack of, I wouldn't say motivation, but a lack of information, something that could help them and mm -hmm. trying to, I mean, test the, the, how the team was, fe was feeling on, during that day. Yeah. Then uh, I was making sure like midweek to like park every part of my teammates and um, ask them, are you, are you gonna be able to deliver things on Friday? If it's like, right. if it's like a weekly thing, um, if that doesn't happen, I always felt like, especially within the department, I try to do you think this artist can help you so you you will f be finishing on time? Yes, no. Um, so I, I didn't want to over pressure things because I felt like people working remotely could be even more stressed mm. than it, that if they were in the studios because sometimes when you're on your own, um, sometimes you you feel like, oh, I'm not doing the things in the right direction or I'm not gonna be able to deliver on time. Sure. So it's, it's always like um, helpful for artists as much as I could to help them um, getting back on tracks and supporting them in any way that I could. How, do you, how did you come to that balance of how much to uh, be in touch with people and how much to leave them alone? Because I, I feel like that's a big challenge as well remotely. Like I think if you trust people, then it's kind of automatic, but if you're just thrown into working remotely, suddenly remote, like everyone is now, um, the understanding of you don't want to drown your teams in too many video calls, too many this or too many that. So how exactly. do you know that? I mean, so, sorry to interrupt you, but you're, you're totally right. I think there, there are times in prediction, in pre-prediction, which, which is what I'm working on, basically, um, that you, I'm trying to be really doing a lot of talking, a lot of talking when we start. Mm -hmm. uh, even uh, right now, I'm working with someone, we do like jam boards. So like, right. we just like open jam boards and we just like do sketch, batch sketches. It's really efficient. It's the first time I really use it. Yeah. I didn't like the tool at first, but I felt like this is great because you can, like three or four people can um, be on the same, uh, on the same jam board. Yeah. Um, we're roughing ideas and stuff. And I felt like this solved problems so efficiently mm. and in a way that I wasn't imagining it. Um, What's the tool that you use? For Jamboard? For the Jamboard, yeah. Like the basic pencil thing. Uh, okay, but do you like, like for example, we use Jamboards, uh, but we use a thing called Miro, uh, which is a virtual whiteboard. So everyone can be on at the same time. That's, that, that, that's, that's the one I use. Yeah. That's the one I'm using. Uh, it's, it's great. So I love it. Th there's, you can see who's drawing on things. Yeah. You just write things down. Uh, people can circle the ideas that people like. Yeah. Someone can do a drawing. Someone can go on top of it, add something to it. And you can create as much pages as you want. And it's really fun doing it. It feels like, I mean, that, that's the thing you couldn't even do if you were in a studio, unless you have like a big whiteboard and things. You know? Well, that's, that's what I found too with the, with the virtual whiteboards is that if, if you talk like some projects, if you look at the, like the artifacts of our journey, like all the artwork, if you actually put that on a wall, it would take up half the studio. Exactly. Just so you're right. There's just nowhere to put it. So I think the, and, and I hate this idea of all the artwork being stuck in these little boxes. I love it being up on a wall so I can have a look at it as a manager and say, oh, you know, maybe we, we should have gone back to where we're going there or we went left and we should have gone right. Like, but we can all see the wide view and then we can see the tight, like, oh, okay, with these little details, and then we can pull back. Exactly. Oh yeah, I really love it. So I think, yeah, that's definitely the, another aspect of it. There are real positives to working remotely that actually 
like the, getting the right balance of the, the sort of virtual work and the physical work, I think can allow people to A, have more time for their families and B, uh, work more efficiently when they do work. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, um, I have a daughter who's five years old, so I drop her to school when there's school. <laughs> Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> and then I start working like at nine. Since we don't have any commutes, mm. I'm saving a lot of time. Mm. So I have more time to do sports, activities, families, cooking a little bit more. Mm. Uh, the only thing is I felt, like especially winter in Paris, when no one's really moving, I feel that there's many days that don't really go out that much in a way. Yeah, yeah you got to force and yourself to do it, right? So um, I don't want to be like, catch potato sort of guy yeah um, I know. yeah so i managed to do like sports twice a week at least what's your go-to sport i play basketball yes i knew that <laughs> i wasn't sure if you still play basketball uh so you're you're uh you're a favorite sports basketball so but i think there's again this whole thing of like keeping healthy and well while while we're remote, working remote i think it's a big thing but also i, I really feel like like, I don't know if you remember, like, like way back in the day, there was this whole principle of, like, chair time. It was an American thing of spending time in the chair. Like, how much time are you at work in your chair? Like, for me, I think that's, there's so much uh, ineffective and busy work in those hours where you're forced to sit in a studio. Um, and I think that there could be more, like, diverse types of meetings and, and interactions that allow you to be more efficient. And not necessarily like, you know, just, just like, like forced to, to do something for eight hours or nine hours. Exactly. Especially when you're um, starting on the project. When you, I mean, I felt like in studio sometimes uh, it's hard to go see an exec and say, oh, do you think I can go to that museum or I can spend time in this library for like a day? Yeah. And like, no, you can't. You're at work. Yeah, but I felt like for the project, it would be good to go to these museums or whatever. Mm. And it's like, it's hard to, so now I'm doing it. I'm go, I'm trying to um, spend time. I mean, I'm lucky enough to live in Paris. So there's plenty of library. I can take pictures. I can go to places. Um, mm. So it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, as you mentioned, staying on your chair eight hours a day sometimes doesn't make you do better art. So I think with the iPad, sometimes I'm working on, on Procreate. Yeah. Uh, on my yeah on my uh sketchbook uh, and trying to diverse uh tools and not feeling too bored at what i do yeah it's that's i think that's a and that's a big i think it's a big challenge for people in general working in studios it's like how do i manage my day and my time and then as a manager how do you make sure your teams are staying energetic and fresh because i do feel like I remember when I was an animator, like sometimes you get stuck in a, uh, like you've got a long scene or a long sequence to deal with and you can like, like work ridiculous hours. Right. And, and you put on yourself just trying to sort of get it done. Um, and often I think managers don't have the tools to help people avoid that. And I think look, what you've been describing is a, uh, is a really interesting learning curve about, about understanding like, okay, what are my more productive times of the day? What are the other times where I'm going to be dealing with managerial stuff or emails? And then where's my family time and health? To me, it's I mean, the time when I'm good at drawing, uh, roughing and getting ideas, it's always the same time. It's always yeah. between 11 and 1 hour and 1 p.m. Yeah. And after 6, because I know that at, after at 7, I need to take care of my family so I don't have much time. Yeah. So that's, that's the time I'm always more efficient. I always felt like after lunch, I'm awful so at drawing. <laughs> It's interesting. It's really, yeah, because I, I, I feel that, you know, I don't draw so much anymore, but I do have that moment or I can feel that moment where I just got nothing left. I can feel that moment where it's like flowing and then it's like, ah, it doesn't work anymore. It's, I mean, I know exactly what you mean. It's always like this for me. There's like a magic, magic time when you're like, I wouldn't say you're on fire, but I mean, feel like everything you do, you're like, ah, oh, it works. You can, you can keep moving, keep moving and you're just mm -hmm. making things. And sometimes I struggle on the rough for like two hours. I look at it. I just try to do some, add some sparkles and some nice shadings and everything. But I'm when I'm trying to be super honest with what I did is like not good. It's terrible. By the way, <laughs> and the thing is because you re, you're working remotely, no one can see that stuff that you put in put away. You put in trash. So it's like yeah, and, and, I, and I, 
And like you said earlier, as, as long as you're disciplined enough to make sure you're delivering and you're communicating clearly, uh, then no one needs to see behind the curtain, right? They need to see the struggle. Yeah. But just it's just like everyone else job, I guess. Yeah, I guess so. But but I do feel like that. Um, like I know when I first started working remotely, I was super paranoid about. Uh, I was trying to make sure that everyone got like extra value from me, so they they weren't being paranoid about what's that what's that one person we have doing way over there. What are they doing? You know, are they working? What are they doing? So I was over communicating and I was constantly working late and I was doing this, doing that. And then I was like, this is insane. This is not a way to structure a day. You're totally right. Yeah, that, I mean, that's exactly how I feel. I mean, especially even if I mean, this happens to me still after all, the, all these years, there's always, always a phase of me being stressed when I'm starting on a new project, when I need to get people trust and, uh, and so I need to prove them. So I'm really... On the first days, on the first weeks, it's not that I'm trying to do more, but I'm trying to um, um, like prove them that they made the right choice by choosing me. Yeah, and make the, it, making the effort to, to go remote. Yeah, right? yeah. and sometimes like, it's, I'm trying to be like, you made the right choice, but sometimes it doesn't really help, and it's just a matter of time. You need to accept that situation. You need to accept that... Um, time when everyone kind of looked at each other kind of western type thing it's like yeah. is he doing the job and also i felt like in um going back to things more specifically um i was working um sometimes not as a manager but also as a background designer for instance mm. uh, for nicky daddy and and i was working with uh great people that was like there were like a link between art directors and designers. Right. Um, I work with uh, Kimberly Knoll. She was great because she really managed to get some feedback from di directors, our director, uh, Chris Garbett. And, and he, uh, she was like spreading the work and really uh, explaining things really clearly. And that was saving time for Chris as well. Mm -hmm. So it was really efficient to me, and I felt that it was really efficient for all the designers, even if a few of, of, of us were r working remotely as well. Not, every, not all of them, but a few yeah. of them. So it's this whole thing of learning and teaching each other, right? So when you get a good manager, they're teaching you how to be a better manager, and when you're working as a designer, you're getting more empathy for designers you're managing. Exactly, exactly. And always, it's funny because every time you do a Skype thing, I always try to <laughs> put myself in this situation, when, when, when the Skype closes, there is always a phase when you think of what's been said, not you judging the people, the, the people you've been Skyping with. Yeah. But there is like a, okay, did I, did I understand things right? So yeah. you're just making sure like you write things down and everything. So. Yeah, that's interesting, that idea, that's that, that note phase, right? Making sure you're getting all the notes down. I mean, I've started using my virtual whiteboard for notes as well. Yeah, it's really good. And sometimes, I mean, there's, when you, if you do like if you're working with uh, production people, execs, there's sometimes people that really are really helpful because as they write down all the notes for you, so you have like a clear feedbacks on everything. Mm -hmm. But I always felt like it was good to take notes in the same times because sometimes uh, it's difficult for them to to write down everything, and sometimes things can there can be some quiproquos and misunderstandings on things that can have a real impact on things. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And, and also as an artist, you hear things differently, right? Like while someone's talking, it might give you an idea or you, and you want to just write it down. You, want, you don't want to interrupt the meeting, but you're like, oh, I need to look into that. What does that mean? How do I, that gives me an idea. What if I connect these dots? What does that look like? Exactly. So it seems to me that like one of the biggest like soft skills then that, that, uh, is, is this whole idea of being able to listen and communicate clearly, right? Exactly. No, I think you're right. Um, uh, you need to be able to read between the lines. Mm. Sometimes, when you, even even if people are really ninety five percent of the time nice with you, and sometimes because that's the way the remote work is doing. If you if to, if you, if you have too much, uh, uh, if there is too much tension in the call. Mm. Um, the communication, the communication really stops because you're not right, right. there with people. Yeah, right. So, but sometimes 
even people are nice, you can see what's behind their mind and behind what they're saying. So you're trying to understand, and that takes time and experience, I guess, sure. but you need to be able to understand where you really want it or when things are not going in the right way. So that's, that's the tricky part, I would say. My experience working with you is it's, uh, if we have a strong, clear brief, then I, I, just, then I just have to wait for the artwork because I know that you, if you have any questions, you ask me. Um, if, if you have any issues delivering, you'll ask me. I, I rely on a clear communication. Yeah. How then, if we say that the, the most important soft skill is communication and being able to listen, um, I feel like people underestimate how hard it is when you're not a native English speaker. You know, in Europe, we're used to people speaking multiple languages and accents and what have you, but in North America, often it's a little bit like, what? Like, what? Well, I was lucky to be, uh, like, a, uh, to go through an exchange student program when I was right. 17. So I spent one year in uh, Marysville, Seattle, Washington State. Okay. Uh, Northwest. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, I've been to Seattle then, once. Yeah, it's an awesome city. Uh, but the thing is, back then, the internet wasn't really working there. So it was, it was a full immersion. So like, no, no Snapchat, no Instagram, no nothing. So I was struggling so hard that I had to speak to survive, I guess. So thanks to that, um, uh, I'm, that was really helpful. And the, the other thing is, um, there's a lot of things in uh, American culture, English culture, that I really loved through sports, through arts, through, mm. through music. Mm. Uh, I, was, I mean, as a lot of people, I guess. But um, I still have a lot of friends in the US mm. um, that I get to talk really, really often now. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I was really wanted to speak English. And when I started working, uh, I worked with uh, Charlie Bean and Chris Garbutt and Dave Needham. Yeah. And even though these guys were really great artists and even the, the project was really good, I felt like um, this is like an extra value for me to speak English. So I really wanted, wanted to value this because I love to try to speak and to get better with the English thing. So yeah, it's, I, yeah. I feel like you've always had a, a huge amount of curiosity uh, uh, around that both culturally and from a language point of view. And, uh, that seems to be an important factor, like staying curious. I, I, I yeah, I, I wouldn't lie to you. The thing is, if I wasn't speaking as much English, even though it's I'm not fully fluent, but it's, uh, it's, um, I wouldn't have a harder time um, getting jobs because sometimes in art, in everything, there's a vocabulary, a vocabulary. There's a certain type of humor that you okay. read. It scripts. Uh, if you don't get the joke, you might miss the real, uh, the real um, gag of the story. You might mm -hmm. miss something, and it's um, so you might make uh, there's some time waste if you don't get things the first time. So even yeah. even with the references, I mean, uh, if someone describes something in the script, now it's it's quite different now. But ten years ago when the US had some uh, references or something, uh, it was harder for Europeans, I guess. Yeah, sure. But, um, uh, which show, which uh, show characters they were referring to and stuff like that. Yeah, I find that really admirable. And I think for me, like having to learn to speak French, uh, obviously you, you saw when I first arrived, I couldn't speak a word. Um, <laughs> it's really good, I can, I can guarantee that. <laughs> but everyone was so patient and, and I've got so much uh, respect for how patient everyone has always been with me. And that's how I feel when now I see uh, folks working with, you know, Mercury where I work or, or other companies in North America, I'm always like trying my best to make them feel safe. Yeah. That's totally, I mean, that's, yeah, it's, there's, I mean, there's two approaches. I mean, when you, I mean, you've been, uh, I was tough for you when you came to France, uh, learn, learning the language. And yeah, sure. it's amazing how you speak with like, no, almost no accents. So no, no one can even notice sometimes that you're not French, honestly, yeah. uh, uh, because you got the, the, the French, the, I mean, the, 
the good accent and everything. But I mean, it's it's either you want to be. It's there's two th two things. I know people that live in the states for like ten years, mm. and they're trying to keep their accent. Right. And that's a good thing. And I think it's it could be a part of the charm and everything. But to me, that's something that I I, I got from uh, being a teenager in the states. Mm. It's like I just hate it when someone after two words, you're not from here, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like in store when I was going to sort and everything, so I was trying to do as much accent effort that I could, even yeah. though even though you can tell I'm not from the from the US for sure. But that was still something that I always had in mind. So I oh, totally I mean, but again that that's the whole thing that brings that empathy, right? Because yeah, I still I remember that when when the, oh, the first few years in Paris, I would try and say something and people would switch immediately into English. And I was like, ah Yeah. Especially in Paris, because a lot of people speak English, and sometimes they're happy to speak English with you. As well, yeah, for sure, for sure. That's another story. Yeah, um, yeah okay, and so I don't want to take up too much of your time, because this is your, your magic hour for drawing. <laughs> but um, but uh, just one last thing, like, again, on the remote work, uh, people are thrown into this right now. Um, and so they, if they have kids and they have family at home, um, how, do you, how have you found that transition and, and trying to manage that? And, and I guess the thing, like, I saw someone yesterday that talked about like not disguising the fact that you're a parent and you have children at home and that's fine. Like, how do you manage that? Well, even though we're doing art and cr there's a lot of creative part and everything, I try not to work on, not, not to work on the weekends. Right. Uh, I try to be uh, a good dad by taking my daughter on things. And even if I'm super busy, on like on catching up with the schedule thing i'd rather work late at night during the weekdays mm. instead of working on saturdays and sundays oh, because yeah. i think if you put a if you if you step into this you don't have any like frame for your week and everything mm. and it's going to be super complicated uh in your family life so um i mean basically as i was telling you i, I mean we have like a me and my wife have a like a schedule, like a day schedule, a mm. weekly schedule. We have like a, an, uh, an, a nanny twice a week, yeah. even though we're working from home. Yeah. She's downstairs with uh, our daughter. And um, we're just making sure that when we stop, we stop. I feel like it was harder when I was like a younger artist to not stop. Like I see a lot of folks in the industry like they're working all the time. I wish I could do it, but I don't have the time for it. I yeah. wish I could do more sketches, but it's just a matter of, of choice. So I think it's, you can do it. I would say like being uh, in a couple really helps. And um, yeah. Yeah, that makes total sense. I mean, uh, it's, certainly, it's certainly something that, um, you know, I've had learned hard way as well, is the, the idea of boundaries and, and setting up structure. I think that's definitely a huge, huge, huge thing. Um, Okay, well, uh, I think this has been really interting and I hope helpful for, for well, certainly helpful for me and for, for other people. Okay. And um, uh, where can people find you on the internet if they want to find your work or they want to like, get in touch or reach out? Uh, there's, I have my Instagram, which is like the easiest way of reaching me, which is like Baptiste uh, Lucas and underscore art. Yeah, I'll put a link in and uh, the yeah. So that's my Instagram, and um, um, I don't go on Facebook too much. I think it's I'm trying to to do like a new kind of a web page and everything. But the problems I'm facing, and you, I think you understand that as well, is we can't. Um, a lot of projects I'm working in development yeah. cannot be shown until like three, five, four, five years. Exactly. So by the time it's on TV, I'm like, I don't want to show this anymore. I feel it's been too long. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, it's, it's so hard to know what to show, isn't it? It's complicated. So yeah. I'm trying to post things at a time. Um, yeah, but that's that's the thing. But well, Instagram, well, I guess it's the easiest way for me to show what I'm doing. That makes sense. Yeah, and uh, and we'll put this video out, and everyone can see how awesome we are uh, at remote work. <laughs> <laughs> you put pressure on me. I'm, I'm, I, need, I need to be consistent. No. <laughs> okay, Betty, have a great day. Thank you so much for the time. Thank you so much, Heath. Bye-bye. Ciao. Ciao.